Previously, in our discussion on the Edmund degradation process, we alluded to the fact that the Edmund degradation process has its limitations. So although it's a very useful process, we cannot use the Edmund degradation under certain circumstances. So we said that if our polypeptide is over 50 amino acids in length, we basically cannot use this process. Now, the question is why? Well, the answer is simple. Just like many processes in nature, the Edmund degradation is not a perfect process and sometimes it does make a mistake, it does create an error. So it turns out that the Edmund degradation process in some cases does not release that amino acid, the first amino acid in that polypeptide chain. Now, to demonstrate how this can be a problem, to demonstrate how this affects accuracy of our procedure, suppose that the efficiency of a single Edmund degradation process is 97%, and that's a high value. So, what that means is, every time the Edmund degradation process takes place, there's a 97% chance that the process will take place correctly. We will label that initial amino acid and then release that amino acid. Now, this isn't a problem when we have relatively, uh, relatively small quantity of amino acids. But what happens if we have, let's say, 50 amino acids in our protein? So we want to calculate mathematically what the probability is of determining the correct sequence by using the Edmund degradation process for a protein with 50 amino acids. So there should be an O after this n. So here we have our amino acid, so here we have our protein, we have amino acid number one, two, three, four, we have five, six, seven, not shown, all the way to 49 and then 50. So if we carry out the Edmund degradation process on this entire polypeptide, what is the probability that we're going to obtain a correct sequence of amino acids? Well, to calculate this probability, we simply have to multiply the individual probabilities of each one of those processes. So we have 0.97 for the first process, 0.97 for the second process, 0.97 for the third process and so forth, all the way to the 50th process when we basically release this final amino acid. And so we have 0.97 to the 50th power and that gives us about 0.22 and that is equivalent to a 22% likelihood. So that's a relatively small likelihood. So what that means is there is a 78% chance that our sequence will not be the correct sequence of amino acids. And so we can see mathematically that's exactly why we cannot use the Edmund degradation process on very long polypeptides. So what we conclude is even though the Edmund degradation process is a very useful process, when our amino acids are very short, it becomes pretty inaccurate pretty quickly when our amino acid, uh, when our amino acid number increases in that polypeptide. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the way that we solve the problem is, if we have a long polypeptide, we divide that polypeptide, we cut up that polypeptide into very small fragments by using special types of molecules and biological enzymes. And so once we cut up these ends, uh, the, uh, the polypeptide into these fragments, we can then isolate and separate those fragments by using some type of purification technique, for example, a gel electrophoresis, and then we can use the Edmund degradation process on those individual small fragments because we just saw that if we have a small fragment, then we can use the Edmund degradation process. For example, to demonstrate that, let's calculate what the likelihood is of our sequence being correct if our amino acid, if our protein or fragment, let's say, is 10 amino acids in length. So all we have to do is basically multiply, let's see if my iPhone has the option to multiply to so point uh, 0.97, we want to raise to the power of 10 
And so this give, nope, that is not it. Try it again, 0.97, no, 0.97 uh, to the power of, let's say 10. Okay, so if we have, if the um, likelihood that our Edmund degradation process is correct is 97%, and we raise that to the power of 10, that gives us, so 0.97 to the power of 10 is about 74% uh, likelihood that it's correct. So what that means is, if we break down the polypeptide into small fragments, the likelihood of it being correct increases tremendously. And so that's exactly what we normally have to do. So to solve the problem, we can cleave the protein into many smaller fragments and then use the Edmund degradation process on each individual process. So let's suppose we have the following polypeptide. So we take that polypeptide, we mix it with some type of molecule that cleaves those peptide bonds. And so for example, if we use a specific type of biological enzyme, for example, let's say we cleave it in this position and in this position, and so we produce fragments A, B, and C. Now we can separate the fragments, for example, based on size by using SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And so what that does is it allows us to isolate these three different fragments, and then we can use the Edmund degradation process on each one of these fragments individually. And so, for example, for fragment one, once we carry out Edmund degradation, we know that, for example, this is amino acid one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, we carry the same process out with fragment B. We know this is fragment one, two, three, and four in that order. And then for C, we have one, two, three, four, five. Now, what we don't know is what the order of these fragments is. So is the order, for example, A plus B plus C, so if this is a fragment A and B and C, do we actually order them in this way, or is it, for example, A, C, and B? So once we determine the specific sequence of amino acids in that, in each segment, we still need to actually determine what the order of those segments is with respect to one another. Now, the question is, how do we determine what the correct order is? Now, before we look at that, let's take a look at the following chart uh, or table. What the table basically tells us is, is, is it gives us some of these examples of these chemicals or biological enzymes that are capable of cleaving our peptides at specific amino acid sequences. For example, we have a special molecule, a chemical known as cyanogen bromide, and what it does is it cleaves our peptide at the carboxyl side of methionine amino acids. For trypsin, this is a biological molecule that is found in our digestive system, and what trypsin basically does is it cleaves our peptide at a specific uh, uh, at a specific site, so at the carboxyl side of lysine and arginine, our two basic amino acids. We also have chymotrypsin, and chymotrypsin cleaves at the carboxyl end of tyrosine, methionine phenylalanine, tryptophan, and leucine. So basically, if we have some type of amino acid that contains an aromatic ring, this is our protein enzyme that cleaves it. And finally, another example is thrombin, and this is found in our blood clotting cascade. So what thrombin does is it cleaves at the carboxyl side of arginine, and we have many, many more examples of such biological enzymes in our body as well as in other organisms. So let's go back to this question. Once we know what the sequence is of these individual uh, uh, segments, how do we order those segments together? So what we have to do is, so we take this polypeptide and we first expose it to one type of cleaving agent. And then we take that same polypeptide again and we expose it to another different type of cleaving agent. So once we expose it to these two different cleaving agents, we have two sets of fragments. 
and then we can use the overlapping regions of those fragments to basically piece the information together just like in a puzzle. So to see exactly what we mean by that, let's take a look at the following example. So in this example, we have some type of polypeptide and when we take the polypeptide and we expose it to trypsin, we get these two fragments. Now we take that same polypeptide in its full polypeptide form and we now expose it to chymotrypsin and we get three fragments that look like this. So what we basically want to do is so assuming that we actually use the Edmund degradation process on each one of these fragments so we know exactly what the sequence is, now what we want to do is we want to piece these fragments together. We want to find what the correct order is of these fragments by using these overlapping regions. Now, what do I mean by overlapping regions? Well, notice I have valine and then I have ar uh, arginine. And the only time I, I have valine and arginine in this section is right over here. So I have valine and I have arginine. So I have valine, then arginine, and then essentially it cuts off here. But in this case, according to this fragment, we have glycine, glycine, then tryptophan, and so forth. So if we have valine, arginine, and then it cuts off, and the glycine, glycine, tryptophan begins on this side, then what that means is this arginine should be bound to this glycine and we were able to determine that by piecing these overlapping regions together. So let's see exactly what we mean by that by putting it in the following. So we have glycine, uh, we have glycine, glycine, uh, So, uh, let's see, we have serine, we have phenylalanine, we have valine, then we have arginine. And then the second piece here is uh, glycine, glycine, tryptophan, then we have alanine, and we have lysine. Okay, so that's segment number one. So just if we just carry out this uh, procedure here, we don't know if this comes first or if this comes first, right? We don't know if it goes here or if it goes here. But this information allows us to basically determine which one goes where. So let's look at this section here. So we have valine arginine, which basically appears here. So we have uh, valine, we have arginine, and then we have if you continue, glycine, glycine, tryptophan. So we have glycine, uh, again, uh, glycine, glycine, and tryptophan, okay? And so what these overlapping regions tell us is there should be a bond in this section here. So there should be a bond connecting arginine and glycine. And by using this region here and this region here, we can basically determine where these two fragments go. So serine, phenyl, uh, uh, serine and phenylalanine should basically go here and alanine lysine should basically go here. So we have our serine uh, phenylalanine and then here we have alanine lysine. And so the final sequence is, so we have serine, phenylalanine, then this should connect valanine, arginine, glycine, glycine, then we have tryptophan, and then alanine, and lysine. So this is exactly what we mean by using the overlapping regions after we expose our polypeptide to not just one 
proteolytic enzymes, but several proteolytic enzymes to basically determine what the order of our segments are. So step number one is we take the long polypeptide, we essentially cleave it with these different types of proteolytic enzymes and proteolytic molecules. We produce these segments, then we essentially isolate the segments by using some type of purification method. Once we isolate, uh, isolate them, we use the Edmund degradation process to sequence them so that we know exactly what the sequence is in each one of our uh, segments is. And then we use the overlapping region information to basically determine how those segments should be arranged with respect to one another. So we see that even though the Edmund degradation process does not actually work on very long polypeptides, if we simply cleave the polypeptides into these small fragments, we can then use that process, the Edmund degradation process, successfully to determine what the sequence of our polypeptide is.